these are difficult times in Trinidad and Tobago. But moments like these give us hope and confidence that these difficult times could bring out the best in us and that we can get out of these difficulties, maybe with a few scratches, but of course, hopefully in a better, stronger place. It was an acknowledgement of these difficulties at the very early stage of this government that we knew that decision making in Trinidad and Tobago would not be the normal kinds of arrangement and would not be easy. And there would be tremendous competition for what little resources are available. And the decision making has to take into account a very firm, unbiased priority list. As against that background, we also understood that there are two areas of governance that must attract the attention of the cabinet at every step of the way. One was energy, and the other was infrastructure. Energy being the lifeblood of our economy, and infrastructure being the pathway by which that economy can be made to grow and be sustained. And it's against that background that as Prime Minister, I established in the Cabinet as part, as part of our ongoing operation, a functioning subcommittee of the Cabinet to deal with energy and energy-related matters. That subcommittee is functioning effectively and has made some far-reaching uh, uh, decisions so far, advising the Cabinet to take certain decisions. The chairman of TNTEC is a member of that committee because TNTEC's role and the input from TNTEC in some matters of energy are vital to our well-being. And Mr. Silju is a member of that committee, which is made up largely of government ministers, technicians from the public sector, and of course, from the public enterprise uh, departments. We also have an infrastructure committee of the cabinet. And we meet sometimes as often as required, but usually about once a month. Or we can meet more often, depending on what the committee is dealing with and how much we need to accelerate the decision-making process. And these two committees contribute tremendously to the stability of cabinet decision-making. Because notwithstanding the fact that the cabinet is made up of competent individuals. We are short of the inputs that are required on every single subject. So these committees allow us to have within the decision-making process the technical and the advisory components of good decision-making. And that is why, as we looked at the development of the nation, especially the balanced development of the nation, very early in our proceedings, coming out of this subcommittee of the cabinet, we saw the need to treat with the issues raised by the previous speakers, the question of Tobago's support for an adequate supply of electricity, the requirement to get moving in ensuring that Tobago has on island generating capacity that is well beyond its immediate needs and looking to fo uh, towards its consumption as the economy of Tobago expands, we had to prioritize what do we spend money on in Tobago at this time to give us the future that we are working towards. And this plant is one of those answers. We recognize very early that as we take steps to expand Tobago's economy, one of the things that will come with that is an increased consumption of electricity. So here it is that at the current consumption levels, we have ups and downs. We have uh, shortages when we have to go on required maintenance. So what we had to do is to make sure that we expand Tobago's electricity generating capacity. We could not hope to rely on the trans-ocean cables, both of which have serious question marks and today I've heard that one is permanently damaged, which means that it's obsolete and can probably not be used. So fortunately, at an earlier time, a similar kind of decision was made. Because not too long ago, all of Tobago's power was generated 
from the diesel plants in Scarborough or from the subsea cables from Trinidad. Together, they could not supply the needs of Tobago adequately as, that, as those needs expanded. So I distinctly recall encouraging one of my colleagues, the former Chief Secretary, to tear onto his portfolio something that never happened in Tobago before, and that was the portfolio of energy. So the Chief Secretary of Tobago had, as part of his portfolio, energy. And the Prime Minister of that time took that uh, official in Tobago who was responsible for energy onto that subcommittee of energy at the time when that committee functioned under a previous government. And it was out of that that came the discussions and the decisions to power Tobago, not by trying to expand the cable supply, to increase the number of cables, to repair the cables, or to increase the diesel power generation in Scarborough or elsewhere, but to bring to Tobago a natural gas pipeline from the eastern fields of northeast Trinidad. And once that decision was made, a very far-reaching development took place. A natural gas pipeline was run from the gas fields to Tobago, and that allowed us to have access to power generation in Tobago using natural gas. And from that development came the plants that are at this location, which significantly improved Tobago's supply and reliability of power, even though we still had experiences of interruptions too frequent, I might add. So now, as we look towards further expansion of Tobago's economy to meet those needs, it was easy for us to simply say, add more gas-driven power generation at Cove in Tobago. But then when we took that decision, under this government, under this subcommittee of the cabinet, we have a much bigger problem immediately. How do we pay for it? And we took the decision at the level of the Ministry of Finance, in conjunction with the Corporation of TNTEC, that we will find out what it will cost. And ladies and gentlemen, today's expansion in Tobago is at a cost of $132 million. Many people look at the budgetary allocation for Tobago and say, oh, that's not enough for Tobago. But most often, they do not recognize that there are additional expenses incurred for Tobago in other parts of the national expenditure. So when we decided to put this plant here for the expansion of Tobago's needs, we immediately took a decision to engage in $132 million uh, for the expense, other than what you would have heard in the budget. But we couldn't fund it immediately in one go. But we knew we had to fund it at this time. So in last year's allocation, we made provision for half of that money. And I was just, to, uh, it was just confirmed to me that TNT got that half last year. Good. So they got half up front. And this year, the other half is allocated for in this budget. So this $132 million, TNTech is funded to proceed with this project over a two-year planning at the level of the cabinet. So on that basis, we are confident that the bills would be paid and this project would be completed within budget and within time. So ladies and gentlemen, that is only one of the infrastructural decisions that were made with respect to national development. Because we acknowledge that even though times are very hard and very difficult and money is hard to come by, if we are to come out of this better off, if we are to come out of this and do what has to be done to give us a better chance in the next go around, we have to find the resources to do the things that have to be done. So that $132 million in that very difficult budget of last year, and in the even more difficult budget of this year, we made provision for that. And of course, that is not the only commitment we are making to Tobago's infrastructural development. Because we are of the view that Tobago's economy can grow considerably and contribute far more to the economy of Trinidad and Tobago if certain things are done on the island of Tobago. And for those things to be done, things like this, 
expansion and power, expansion and water, improvement in the security and safety, it, uh, port services, those kinds of things have to be in place so that the environment in Tobago would be of the nature to encourage the kind of business and the growth of the economy which we believe can happen in Tobago, giving Tobagonians an improvement and sustained quality of life that they've been accustomed to, but more importantly, to get involved in economic activity, both from the local standpoint, from the regional standpoint, and looking towards an international economy, and sometime in the not too distant future, Tobago's growth and Tobago's contribution to the national economy would be surprising to many. So it is against that background that not too long ago I had the opportunity to take part in a function like this here in Tobago when we opened the Met Office here in Tobago. Basic infrastructure that had to be had. That's one of the uh, premier facilities in the region now, that, opportunity, that facility down at the airport. And the cabinet, which is currently struggling to make ends meet, in that struggle, we're still identifying significant infrastructural development for Tobago. As I speak to you now, the long-anticipated Grange police station is under construction on Shervan Road. And when that project is completed, it would be one of the finest police stations in the region. In parallel, a similar facility is under construction at Roxborough. So we'll have two very modern police stations, one in the west, one in the east, and on the drawing board, we have a third one for the Plymouth area. And together, these uh, infrastructural units, hopefully, would be fully utilized by those who are charged with the responsibility to put them to work, to ensure that safety and security in Tobago would be at an acceptable level, and to be able to continue to boast of being clean, serene, green, and I may add, safe. We're also expecting to have some significant improvement in all our tourism plans in Tobago, expecting greater inflows of tourism in the not too distant future as our projects come on stream and as our improvements in what we have come along. And therefore, what exists now as a terminal building at the Arthur Robinson Airport is not satisfactory. And therefore, the cabinet has taken the decision to proceed with the project of building a new terminal building at the Arthur Robinson Airport, a complete new terminal building. The site has been agreed upon. This work is being done in close collaboration with the Tobago House of Assembly and its technical people, the Civil Aviation Authority, the Airport Authority, and the Cabinet. Because the key to the whole thing is, how is it going to be paid for? That would be a significant expense. But we need it if we are to get that kind of facility in operation in a timely manner. So whereas we could have allocated two tranches of significant but not overly large sums for this particular project, we could not do so reasonably with respect to the terminal building. But what we could do is what we said we're going to do. And that is to tap into private sector monies that may at this time be lying idle in the banks in Trinidad and Tobago or elsewhere. And the way we will do that is to invite public private partnership arrangements where the private sector will be invited to compete for that project on a build own lease transfer arrangement. And once we select a supplier under those arrangements, the private sector will fund that project, will build it, will own it, and when it is being built, built and being utilized by the government, government will then be in a position to make smaller and regular payments over a period of years as lease payments. And at the end of that period, the facility comes to the state for, usually it is a dollar, transferred for a dollar, having paid for it over a number of years. So because we can't afford the large expense now, doesn't mean that we can't proceed with the project. That mechanism allows us to have the facility now and pay for it in the future in manageable payments going forward. So that is the basis on which we expect the cabinet to go forward in clearing for immediate construction 
a new terminal building in Tobago. Wasa has already got the clearance, as you heard, to proceed with a desalination plant to ensure that at no time in the not too distant future, especially as we expand our tourism plants, that we have situations where there isn't enough water in Tobago. And in every dry season, you have this problem of a shortage of water in Tobago. Of course, these things are not cheap, but they are required. You can't have the kind of environment wanting to in invite the kind of visitor levels in Tobago, where you go to a hotel and you don't have water, toilets can't flush, or every five minutes the power has gone, no air conditioning, no kitchen operations. Those are not the kinds of situations we want when we invite people to Tobago. So the infrastructure investment and expenditure have to be made and they have to be made now. With respect to, there's one other project that we have on the uh, immediate drawing board for execution and that is the building of a breakwater outside of the Magdalena Hotel, a hotel which is state owned and for which we are seeking to aim to get an international brand label if we can find one to allow the hotel to be marketed internationally in such a way as to make full use of its location and its, its, its uh, offerings as a family or resort destination. The beach is a problem, but we've had to wait on the engineering and other kinds of technical inputs. And the last report I have is that that is pretty close to completion. And very soon we should be able to go out for tender for the building of that breakwater, which will give that hotel uh, the development of a very fine beach and that will complete its uh, presentation and we will move towards trying to get it lifted from just being a Magdalena in Tobago to an internationally branded uh, Magdalena which is what we recognize across the world. I need not raise with you this morning our effort to maintain an interest in the Sandals project. That project is still with us and we will continue to work towards making it a reality. We are currently doing the prep work that is responsible for that. We've signed the Memorandum of Understanding with the Sandals Group. And let me once more say something about this project. For the umpteenth time, we've chosen the Sandals Group because we want what the Sandals Group has to offer. And I know of no other brand in the region which has the similar offerings, not the least of which is the ability in marketing the resort to lift significantly the air transport into Tobago to meet the adequate number of rooms and the quality of offerings from all the rooms in Tobago at Sandals and everywhere else. There's no other brand which is available to that. And our position in the government is if you need a dentist and the best dentist is available, you don't go and look for a heart specialist. And we are proceeding with this, notwithstanding the ill-informed and some of them quite negative comments coming from other quarters. The project is still a project of priority for us, and we are taking steps to ensure that we get the best opportunity to have that in the island. We are very soon going to be going out for the um, processes that are involved in the applications for the approvals. And at that stage, the relative the consultations will take place here in Tobago. And of course, when we had gone further in the process, um, what this process is going to be, where the government is the main owner of the facility, whatever goes to the project, it goes to us, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We have put it out as a project that um, should attract some investment from the private sector. And already, we have got positive responses from Massey and from Guardian Holdings, expressing a willingness to invest in the Tobago Sandals project. And therefore, we will continue to beat that path towards a successful completion sometime in the not too distant future. One of the more vexing issues on the table for Tobago, as I talk about infrastructure, I must talk about the ferry service. I must tell you, I've been very disappointed that after waiting patiently for the sixth time in, under this government, I think for the third time, to hear that we have gone through a process hopefully meticulously, and at the end of the process that we have selected a vessel. 
I did hear that the process had generated 13 vessels, and I felt very good about that because I thought out of 13 vessels would come one. And I did indicate to the minister and his subordinates that as soon as the port's process is complete, as soon as the process has the board in a position to say we have selected a vessel to recommend to the Ministry of Works, I would call the cabinet in emergency session, whatever day of the week, so that cabinet could look at it and approve what the board has recommended, if that is the case. And then I'm told by the Ministry of Works that the port has reported that the process has failed. They have not been able to recommend any of the vessels that have been uh, in the process. Now, I must say, I am very disappointed about that. But as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, I'm not without the authority of the cabinet and without the authority of the office of the cabinet and the prime minister. And having been told that that is the outcome of that process, I, as prime minister, took responsibility for ensuring that the Christmas season and the carnival season does not need to be go without this very valuable piece of infrastructure. So what was done, I appointed a subcommittee of the cabinet which includes the Minister of Public Utilities here this morning, the Minister of Finance, the Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, and the Minister of Tourism, to go through another process, quite acceptable, using NIDCO, a state enterprise, the same one that had, gone, that had bought the, um, the Express and the Spirit, the Spirit and the water taxis, to use that process under the watchful eye of the Cabinet Subcommittee and to go out to international brokers and find a vessel which meets our needs and the cabinet will ensure that that process comes to a satisfactory conclusion and that there's a boat here in Tobago at the earliest opportunity. You see, immediately that drew criticism from all quarters. How can you do that? How can cabinet get involved? How can the prime minister get involved? Let me tell you how. Because when the boat is not there, when the service is not there, it is the Prime Minister and the Cabinet that you hold accountable. You give me the authority, you give me the responsibility, and I will make sure that there's a boat here in Tobago before the not too distant future. Because you see, what do you say to a situation where we go out by a tender process in a government agency, this time the Port Authority, and on six successive occasions, on six successive occasions, you are told that the tender process has failed for one reason or the other. Well, it was my view that I was not prepared to subject the people of Tobago and the people of Trinidad and Tobago to a seventh failure. The cabinet has intervened, and you look forward to a vessel in the not too distant future. As we look at the country's infrastructure, today we are in Tobago. But we look at the entire country of Trinidad and Tobago. And we do not focus only on one area. The infrastructure development, the same way Tobago has needs, other areas in the country has needs. One of the first things that the government did through the same infrastructure committee I mentioned was having won the cases in the court and got back almost a billion dollars from the OS project on the highway from San Fernando to Point Fortin. The Infrastructure Committee, using the processes that we use of open tender for contractors, we were able to restart in the Southwest Peninsula the highway from San Fernando to Point Fortin. So in that area, that major infrastructural development is currently underway. We have awarded a number of contracts, and there are other contracts in the pipeline to be awarded in the very near future. So that is a major piece of expenditure taking place at that end of the country at this time. Already we are committed to almost a billion dollars of expenditure on that road going forward. With respect to the eastern part of the country, probably the most undeveloped and deserving of the country, I distinctly recall standing in front of 5,000 people in San Grande during the general election of 2015 and saying to them, Put us in office, and we will improve the infrastructure from Valencia to Toco, from Kumuto to Sangre Grande. 
and we will link Tobago to Trinidad in a way that has never been done before because we are going to build a ferry facility in, a port facility in Toko that will allow a ferry service to Tobago of under an hour. The persons in that area agreed and elected us to office. So today, I make no apologies to anybody in Trinidad and Tobago for the project that this government is executing in the eastern part of Trinidad to serve the people of Komuto, Sangri Grande, Kumana, all the way, Toko, all the way to Matlot, the eastern part of Trinidad. They have a call on what this country has to offer too, and their time for development has come, and this government has a mandate to do that. So those who are upset about that, please accept my humblest apology. But the mandate to do that lies in the thousands that were in the square in Sangri Grande and gave us the mandate to develop their area like other areas in the country. So that project is now underway, starting in Komuto, taking us to Sangri Grande, and it will take us, the cabinet only last week, approve the alignment of the improvement of the road from Valencia to Toko and the consultants are at work on the preparing the technical work for the application to the EMA for the Toko port. That is the kind of work that is going on in Trinidad and Tobago at this time. With respect to Central Trinidad, which is largely um, highlighted by the energy sector, where the Point Lisa's companies were facing significant gas shortages and closure in some situations when this government came into office. I can report to you here in Tobago today that those matters have been addressed and addressed adequately to the point where we are now looking towards and receiving improved gas supplies. And the future is a five billion US dollar investment in gas production that gives Point Lisa a future starting now going forward. And for the longer term, the same committee I mentioned to you a while ago, the subcommittee on energy, driven by our contacts and diplomatic relations with Venezuela, we are now very close to the final signings of access by Trinidad and Tobago to Venezuelan gas that will provide far more gas to Trinidad and Tobago than we now know exists in Trinidad and Tobago. That access to the hibiscus platform from the Venezuelan dragon field and other supplies from Venezuela puts Trinidad and Tobago in a situation where we can now look indefinitely into remaining as a major player in the gas industry, and that is the lifeblood of Trinidad and Tobago. That is what we have accomplished in the last 24 months, and that is an infrastructure development guided from the cabinet in a similar way as this project has been guided. So Central Trinidad and the growth of Point Lisa and its stability, they got that. Now, on the south coast, we told the people of Maruga, put us into office, and we will bring development to you and bring you into the national economy. As I speak to you now, the road improvement project of significant millions of dollars is underway in Maruga. That project, the South was turned for that project a few weeks ago and the contractor is on site. And if you had looked at the papers only this um, last week, you would have seen the map on the paper indicating to you road users that road improvement works are underway in the South Coast of Maruga. And alongside that, we are building uh, an agro-processing uh, facilitated down there to encourage farming so that farmers can have their produce uh, prepared for the market and we are also currently working on preparing the fishing port in Moruga so the south coast gets that. On the east-west corridor where the largest population in the country lives they don't have a demand for a port, they don't have a demand for a highway, they have a demand for housing and therefore you would have seen recently the announcement of an, a change in the government's approach at the HDC, where the HDC would function mainly with respect to servicing its current estates and focusing on rentals mainly for the lowest income persons who can't afford a mortgage. But for those who can afford a mortgage of some kind, that the private sector is now incentivized and invited to come into the HDC and to build using their efficiencies and their facilities and to build units at the public will access those units by way of the HDC's database for houses, which currently stands at over 100,000. So everywhere in this country, there is development. Everywhere in this country, there is infrastructural development. In the Western Peninsula, in my own constituency, as I speak to you now, the completion 
of the Diego Martin Sports Complex, a facility that was left there unattended in the foundation stage for five years. That project is now close to completion, and I can tell you that by March of next year, the people of the Diego Martin and the Western Peninsula will have as fine a facility as exists anywhere in this country, and all of these things are being done at a time when we are strapped for cash. We might be strapped for cash, but we are not short of ideas, workable ideas, and that is why all these projects are currently underway, and they will contribute to economic growth in this country. They will contribute to economic development in this country. They will contribute to an improvement in the quality of life in this country. Overall, they will contribute to opportunities, job opportunities across this country, and of course, businesses, and contribute to a secure future in Trinidad and Tobago. So today, I want to congratulate the management of TNTech led by Mr. Ramsuk and his team. I want to congratulate the board of TNTech led by Mr. Sergio and his team. I want to congratulate the Tobago House of Assembly for cooperating with the central government and the board and the management for cooperating because without cooperation, the smallest problem becomes a mountain that you can't climb. But with cooperation, the most intractable problem becomes one that is so easily and immediately soluble. I'm pleased that we do have, between Trinidad and Tobago, an administration in Tobago and one in Trinidad that see eye to eye on Tobago's development and Trinidad's development and Trinidad and Tobago's development. I'm pleased that the management in Trinidad of TNTech and the management of TNTech in Tobago, as professionals of the highest quality, are delivering to the people of Tobago what we expect from our professionals. So I hope that this project will be completed soon, safely, and it will, com it will contribute to the promised improvement in the supply of electricity in Tobago. It is not everywhere in the world that you have a population of 65,000 people or thereabouts, probably 60,000, and they can now boast of having 80 megawatts of power available to them. That is world-class supply, world-class service, for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you for your attention.